praise the hallelujah in the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm
Good morning, Open Bible Church, San Jose. We are thrilled that you are online with us this morning and uh, just giving you a little bit of, a, of an update. I am uh, four weeks, uh, four and a half weeks post-operation date of a left knee replacement surgery, and I am still just trying to find my comfort zone with sitting and standing and 
all of that stuff when it comes to um, speaking and being able to be in the pulpit. Uh, last week was my first day back after, first week back after being off for a few weeks and so thankful for our staff, our worship team. Uh, so thankful for my son Caleb as he uh, did such a great job in uh, just leading us and continuing our series on wisdom. Uh, progressively, I am uh, slowly improving. Uh, last week, I was on a walker. This week, I'm on a cane and will be um, graduating, hopefully, in the next week or so to be able to be walking on my own. Still not driving as I am still on some uh, pretty heavy-duty medication for pain and uh, just um, taking things one day at a time, one step at a time, literally one step at a time. Uh, this morning I am thrilled to be able to bring you a message regarding uh, something that's continuously been very, very near to, dear to my heart, and that's continuing our series on wisdom. Uh, just quickly, we are five weeks away from Easter, and we are diligently putting together um, a, a month's worth of activities, focuses, messages, detail. We're going to be sending out information, flyers. We'll have cards, handout cards available for those of you that would like to invite others to come to the service or join you in your home for watching the service online. Um, we are absolutely um, excited about this year for, for Easter, and we want you to be excited as well. Um, so five weeks away, and we'll be keeping you in the loop with all the things that are happening. Easter comes early this year. It's the 31st of March. Usually it falls in the first week, midweek of uh, month of April. Uh, but this year, again, it, it's going to be early, which is okay. We're, we're getting ready for that. Um, this morning I want to talk about uh, continuing on with the theme of being a wisdom hunter and what it looks like. And, and the title of my message is, um, is, I want to be a wise guy. I want to be a wise guy. And uh, where did that come from? You know, I grew up in the era of all kinds of different types of shows and different things like that. Um, I used to watch the reruns of the old Three Stooges series, the movies, the shows, and Larry, Curly, and Moe always had me, had me laughing or just shaking my head. Um, their slap, literally slapstick comedy um, probably wouldn't fly as much in today's culture, but back then it was a comic success. Um, one particular exchange ha that happened frequently within the Three Stooges movies and shows uh, involved a saying that usually went like this, Oh, wise guy, huh? And uh, the implication, uh, it would always end with maybe a push or a shove, a bonk or a slap, or some other indication that their wise attitude wasn't appreciated. And for those of you that are, uh, are joining us um, on, online, uh, if you were to Google uh, that phrase, um, uh, a wise guy, huh? Um, you will find that there's a YouTube clip of a lot of the old uh, Three Stooges shows that is uh, depicting when that expression was being used. Uh, we're going to be showing it live in person for those that are here during the in-person service because copyright laws sometimes won't allow us to post things online uh, for you to be able to watch. So that's why I'm directing you to the YouTube video if you Google, um, oh, a wise guy, and see where that takes you with the Three Stooges. Anyway, um, the connotation of this expression is not a positive one as the person responding saw this as a slight that the other person was trying to make against them to make them look small or, pardon my language, stupid. And uh, this morning, though, I want to emphasize how in Scripture, God wants us to be a wise guy. Um, I want to be a wise guy this morning. We'll look at what it means to have wisdom in our lives and how it blesses us or how wisdom can bring 
us happiness. So the first thing I want to share is, um, is out of Proverbs chapter 3. And basically it's saying to us, we are happy when we find wisdom. We are happy when we find wisdom. And it says this, Proverbs 3, 13 and 14. Blessed are those who find wisdom. And the idea of blessed means happy. Happy are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. And so basically, uh, Solomon is saying wisdom is priceless. If you can find wisdom, you will find happiness. So wisdom can bring happiness uh, in a number of ways. I have a few, but it's not limited to that. But wisdom's not limited to gender, to skin color, socioeconomic, sta socioeconomic status, how smart, kind, or funny you are. It is for those who will apply it to their lives. Wisdom changes us as we pursue something greater than ourselves. It teaches us how to live our lives in a way that is, is safe. Wisdom teaches us to stay out of trouble. And it teaches us what are the right things to do and what are the things that we shouldn't be doing. It warns us of pitfalls that can come across our path, shows us how to respond to and treat others in a loving, kind, in a positive way. Excuse me. Helps us be better husbands, wives, parents, children, sons and daughters. It brings understanding. Wisdom can help people gain a deeper understanding of the world and the people in it. Uh, this understanding can help us emphasize, empathize with others, recognize how we each uh, interconnect with each other and how we get along. Uh, and it helps us to appreciate the complexities of uh, ethical decision making and what all goes into making right choices. Um, it can grant joy, wisdom can grant joy to those who live by it. Wisdom brings a peace of mind and heart as well as strength to face the day-to-day -day struggles and problems. And it brings all of life into an eternal perspective. Just a few things, just a few thoughts of how wisdom can bring us happiness. Charles Spurgeon said, wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know it is not to be wise, to know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. Spurgeon goes on to say, there is no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. And so that's the whole dynamic of how wisdom makes us happy is it gives us the application of the right things that we need to put in place uh, in order to live our life. Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, where does it all begin? We're happiest when we find wisdom, and we find wisdom in a relationship with God. So, that leads me to my second point, which is we are happiest when we are serving God. Wisdom tells us we are happiest when we are serving him. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, the first part of verse 26 says, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness to those who please him. And the idea of pleasing God is to do his will. Those of us that are walking in the will of God are walking in a means by which to please him. When you choose to live for God, he will make it worth your while. Amen. He truly will. He will never leave you hanging. He will never abuse your relationship with him. He will never abandon you or play games with your life. His sole desire is to bring you in relationship with him, and he will use you to change the world. Hallelujah. God has a perspective that is so big that we can't even think, comprehend, or grasp how big this uh, perspective is. And yet, God allows us, he gives us just a little bit to have a part in that. So that not only can we change our own eternity, but that we can change the eternity of others in our life. So God is happiest 
We are happiest when we are serving Him. You know, when I came to God, I had I had already had a pretty heavy exposure to Him growing up. But when I walked away from Him for a while, 14 to 17 approximately, uh, what brought me back to Him was knowing that there was an emptiness and a rudderlessness to my life that I, I just couldn't um, I just couldn't fill. You know, people talk about a God-shaped void in their lives that only God can fill, and we spend our lives trying to fill it with so many different things, but it can only be filled with a personal relationship with God. And so I found that out at age 17. And so God came into my life, and so when I turned back to Him and I surrendered my life over to Him, it's then that I really, truly found peace and happiness because what was I doing? I, I was now serving God. Mark Twain said the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. I love that because I think at that point in my life I found out why. I found out that God loved me, that God redeemed me, restored me because of that love. He forgave me. Um, he didn't overlook my sin because he died for it. He paid the ultimate price and penalty for it. But what he did is he gave me another chance at life to live for him. And I never looked back. And to this day, I have been serving for serving God for 40, oh my goodness, 40 plus years, 45, 46 years of my life at least. And I've, I've never regretted a single day. So wisdom helps you find your why. Why are we, why are we born and for what reason, what purpose? And it is to please God. We live to please God. Number three, when you walk in wisdom, others will be happy with you. It's an interesting thought. Think about this with me. Uh, I, found a, I found a scripture um, in Second Chronicles, and the Queen of Sheba had come, heard so much about Solomon and Jerusalem and uh, Solomon's wisdom, and so she had to come see for herself. So she came and she spent some time with Solomon, and this is what she said. She said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe what they said until I came and saw with my own eyes. She goes on to say, Indeed, not even half the greatness of your wisdom was told me. You have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. You know, I think as a, as a pastor and as a leader, it's so vital and important that I'm walking in wisdom. I, I can't say that I've always succeeded. I'm going to stand for just a moment. I, I can't say that I've always succeeded, um, but I really tried to the best of my ability to... Um, to walk out God's wisdom, not only in my life personally, but also in my life professionally as I lead people in their relationship with, with the Lord. And I truly believe that when you walk in wisdom, you bring something to your leadership that others can find, can bring them happiness as well. During Solomon's greatest years with God, it was evident just how amazing his kingdom was and as, and as he walked in the wisdom that God gave him. John Wooden, the infamous uh, basketball coach for the UCLA Bruins back in the day, said, Talent is God-given. Be humble. Fame is man-given. Be grateful. Conceit is self-given. Be careful. Talent, be humble. Fame, be grateful, conceit, be careful. Well, how does that factor in? Well, Solomon did not stay 
on the right path. Um, it wasn't until later in Solomon's reign that the little choices he made to turn his back on God and to serve the gods of all of his wives began to, to haunt him. And, um, and this caused his kingdom to fall into great spiritual disarray. So what we find is that wisdom brings certain elements to relationship, that brings certain elements to uh, people that we interact with. Because when we walk in wisdom, other people are happy. You know, my wife is happy when I walk in wisdom. My kids are happy when I walk in wisdom. I, I hope my church is happy when I walk in wisdom. Because it brings all kinds of things to the relationship. I, I have a few mentioned here. It brings trust. It brings peace. It brings direction. It brings respect. It brings safety. And, and I think people are looking for that safe place, that leader that will lead them in the right direction. You know, the greatest responsibility that I cherish is the responsibility that I have to lead people in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Whether it's praying with them to receive Christ or it's discipling them, nurturing them, mentoring them, encouraging them in their walk with him and to watch and see them grow in their faith and to, and to in turn be influential in the lives of others. And then the fourth one, this is an interesting one too, because we are happy, wisdom causes us to be happy when we're corrected by God, when God corrects us. And God uses wisdom to do that. Job chapter 5 verse 17 says this. It says, blessed is the one whom God corrects. Blessed is one. Happy is the one that God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. I don't know about you, but I hate to be corrected. I don't like to be disciplined. Um, it's embarrassing. Um, it puts you into defense mode. Uh, puts you into denial. It causes one to um, uh, causes one to be angry. Causes one to uh, not want to um, not want to listen. And so there's all kinds of things that get dredged up when we are uh, brought into a place of, of correction. But the Bible says that it's important that we are correctable, teachable, that we are moldable, pliable, shapeable, and that we are open to God's correction. John C. Maxwell said a man must be big enough to admit his mistakes, smart enough to profit from them, and strong enough to correct them. So we must be big enough to admit our mistakes, smart enough to grow, learn, as he says, profit from them. That's what I think when I think of profit, grow or learn from them. And then we must be strong enough to follow through and, and make those corrections. Proverbs 15 31 through 33 says, whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the one who heeds correction gains understanding. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. You know, the whole dynamic of relationship begins with fearing the Lord. And Caleb talked a little bit about what that fear looks like. It's not a, oh, I'm shaking in my boots fear, but it is a fear that says, I have enough healthy respect of a God who could bring uh, judgment upon me, and I respect that dynamic of him, but I also know that I have a God who loves and cares for me, and I'm going to serve him with my whole heart. That's what the fear of the Lord uh, teaches us. And so... Um, Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews, uh, talks about being disciplined. 
And I want to read verses 5 through 6 and verses 9 through 11. So please follow along with me if you would. Uh, the writer says, and, you have, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. So why am I happy when God corrects me? It's because I know that he loves me. He says he, ch he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. And then verse 11 through 9 says this, or excuse me, 9 through 11. Moreover, we, have all, we all have had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? You see, they, our fathers, earthly fathers, disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained. By it. I know God's discipline is going to make me a better believer, a better follower of him. It's going to make me a better dad. It's going to make me a better husband. It's going to make me a better man, a better person, a better pastor. You see, uh, I'm not perfect. I, I, I know I don't want to shatter anybody's vision of me. Uh, but let me just, you'll hear it straight from me. I'm not perfect. Well, maybe you already heard that because I'm sure my wife would have said something though. I always tease my wife about that, but I'm so thankful that um, she doesn't go around sharing all of our little secrets about how imperfect I am. But, um, but again, I, I'm not perfect, but yet I serve a God who is, and a God who, whose desire is to grow me into the best man of God that I can be. And in order for that to happen, he's got to correct me. He's got to bring discipline into my life. Lastly, that discipline is so important because it is a vital part of protecting our relationship with God. So we are happy when wisdom protects our relationship with God. And this is really important. Proverbs 28, 14 says, Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens her heart falls into trouble. So this is the danger of taking God for granted. This is the danger of, of allowing your heart to harden. That's what sin does. You know, we've talked before in the past about, um, about eternal security and things like that. And, and I am not a big fan in, the, in, in favor of the phrase, uh, lose your salvation. Because I don't believe we ever lose our salvation. But let me be very, very specific and clear when I say that. There's nothing you can do for you to lose your salvation. God loves you so much. But what happens when we continue to allow things in our life, like Solomon did, that turn our heart away from God, what we do is we don't lose our salvation, but we choose to walk away from it. So why do I believe that? Number one, it was a choice that brought you to faith. You chose to serve Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. You chose to invite him into your heart as Lord and personal Savior. So when you came to Christ and you came into relationship with him, you never lost that ability to choose. Over the course of time, it is our prayerful desire and hope that we would continue to choose him. We would continue to choose him. But for those people that lose focus and they lose perspective and they lose direction, they begin to drift. And at what point does a person turn away from God? I, I don't know. I don't know. Just like I don't know when a person comes to Christ as Lord and personal Savior. I mean, they can say they did, but did they really? Only God is the one who judges the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. 
Only God can see when a person comes to faith, and only God can see when a person rejects and walks away from that faith, because it's a matter of the heart. That's why it says, um, whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. There are things that we allow into our lives that could definitely harden our heart. They take away our desire for more of God. I've seen people come to Christ and be so excited, and then over the course of time, other things get in the way, and, and you, could, you could never bother them for them to show up and come to church or, you know, to read their Bible or to pray or have anything to do with God. Um, have they lost their salvation? I don't know. I don't know. But their hearts are hardened, and that's a dangerous place to be in. And when we harden our heart, then we, we're not at that place where we can really truly love God and serve God. So I'm happiest when wisdom comes and protects my heart, my relationship with God. Hebrews 13.8, the writer says this, Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. And that's my goal, is to live honorably, but to also live with a clear conscience. You know, looking over my shoulder for sins that I'm living in that nobody else knows about, not looking over my shoulder because I have a past that is not redeemed. Not worried that something's going to go up on a screen at my life's end and everybody's going to see what a horrible person I was and what a horrible sinner I was. But if I live with a clear conscience, I don't have to worry about any of that. Somebody once said a clear conscience is a soft pillow. A clear conscience is a soft pill. In other words, I can go to bed at night and not have any worries about anything in my life coming back to haunt me because I, I choose and strive to live with a clear conscience. And what, why is that? Because wisdom helps me to walk in a way that protects my relationship with God. And then if I go to Hebrews 4, 11 through 12, um, it says, I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When I believe, excuse me, I don't think this is Hebrews, I think this is Proverbs, Proverbs 4, 11 through 12. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. When we, when we walk with a clear conscience, when we walk in such a way that our lives are protected from, um, from things that can harden our heart, then we, we are able to run without worrying about tripping, falling, stumbling, messing up, because God makes our legs strong. He makes our stance strong in him. So as I close this morning, I just want to remind you that God wants us to be wise guys. Eh, wise guy, he sure does. He wants us to be happy in, in, our, in the wisdom that he has for us. So wisdom makes us happy always. Wisdom tells us that we are happiest when we're serving God. How is your relationship with him? Walking in wisdom makes others happy as well. And we are happy when God allows wisdom to correct us, and we walk in that correction, and that's walking in his forgiveness. And then lastly, wisdom protects our relationship with God. I love walking in wisdom. I love when wisdom gives me clear instruction on what I should do and how I should live. And I truly hope that you can find that as well. Thank you for putting up with my wise guy comments today, and I hope and pray that you would determine in your heart to be a wise guy, to serve after God, to love him, and to not let anything get in the way of what God has in store for you. We love you. We appreciate you. Coming up next week, as we head into the month of March, we're going to be preparing for our Easter services, and we want you to be fully prepared um, not just for you personally, but to be an ambassador 
to be someone to uh, be the voice of the gospel and to bring others to Christ. We love you. We appreciate you. And my parting comment to you is be a wise guy. Be a wise guy. God bless you. See you next week. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. For the battle belongs to you.